Well, I want to thank you for joining us today on this Tuesday Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we are very grateful for the opportunity to open up your word and learn a little bit more about what you want us to know so we might grow in our relationship with you. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. We uh, continue our look at the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. And so as we start to look at this, what, you know, the title for this in many of the translations is One in Christ. But, you know, this is actually a pretty good title because today's lesson really has to do with two people who've been divided by race, by religion, by many cultural things that divided them, and they were at war with one another, but somehow Paul was calling them to live together as one in Christ. This is the power of Jesus Christ. See, we live in a very nationalistic day in the United States of America. There are people who want national USA, America, yeah, that's it. You know what? It's not about America. It's about God. It's about our relationship with God. And that means that if a person happens to be from, oh, I don't know, Guatemala or um, Chile or maybe England or maybe uh, uh, the Congo or China, we are called to work at being one as one people. Jesus is to overcome these cultural gaps, these political gaps. We can't even get along with each other in the United States today. And so our relationship with Jesus Christ needs to be preeminent, the most important thing. Unfortunately, we make it about our politics and so many things that are just not of, uh, that are of transitory importance. They, they don't last, okay? Jesus lasts for an eternity. Let's focus on what's important. This is what Paul was trying to get people to realize back in his day. So it's really an important lesson for us today. So listen to this. So remember that at one time, you Gentiles, so again, he was addressing the Gentiles, the nations. So we take a look at the, the two different groups, which we probably have the Gentiles and the Jews. And he's going to title these people the uncircumcised. And these, of course, will be the circumcised. These are the people that did everything right. They followed all the rules and all the laws. These are the people that came in the back door some other way into this relationship with Christ that kind of steamed a little bit of these people, ticked them off a little bit. And uh, they, so there was this war between these two cultural groups. So remember that at one time, you Gentiles by birth, you were called the uncircumcision by those who were called the circumcision, the Jews. A physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. So this was a procedure done by the rabbi, okay, uh, for boys when they're, you know, about eight days of age, I guess it was, when they were circumcised as Jews. It's a physical sign, okay? But it has to do with their relationship with God, a demonstration to God of their faithfulness. However, it's just a human ritual. That's what Paul is trying to tell them. It's a human ritual. This should not be divisive. All right, so it goes on. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. Okay, so I want to stop here because this is important. Now, sometimes religious people, religious Christians, religious Jews, religious Muslims. We believe that it's in the following of the ritual that you demonstrate your faithfulness. Paul is trying to indicate that this does not earn somebody a relationship with God. However, he does want to point out that the Gentiles were without God, not because they were not circumcised, because they didn't open up that door to God. They didn't understand who this God was. 
No, in one sense, it's not their fault. They had no opportunity to hear about who this God was. So let's go on. So what does he say? So you were without Christ. Remember, you were a time without Christ. That isn't again demonstrated by their lack of circumcision. They're still, by the way, the Greek and the Gentile Christians, many of them, most of them still did not become circumcised because, you know, that was another battle that Paul uh, and uh, Paul fought with the early church about how the, and Peter, how the Gentile Christians did not have to follow the rituals of Judaism in order to become Christians. So remember that you were at a time without Christ. He went on, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Okay, so they weren't brought near by circumcision. How were they brought near? By Jesus Christ. Okay? So it wasn't a ritual that they followed. And this is something that in our church we tend to want to, you know, we want to try to control things. When, when were you saved? It's funny, we talked about this on Sunday. When were you saved? And this is a very common question people ask. And I, I always tell folks, I'm in the process of being saved. I'm not saved yet. I'm in the process of being saved. God is working his salvation in me. So I, it's a promise of God. Okay? But I'm still walking on this journey. And uh, that's a great thing. And so uh, Christ has already rescued me, but I'm still in the midst of the storm of this world and this life. And so it's, salvation is still a process that God is doing for me. But what we do is we turn salvation into work, something I do. And that's what we mean when we ask somebody, when were you saved? When did you say the sinner's prayer? When did you do things the right way? And so what will happen is you'll have people who come to confession in Christ, and then a year later they realize their life is still a mess, and not in the condition that they want it to be. I guess I didn't really repent the way I should have, so I'm going to do it again. Oh, then I was really saved until a year later. They look back on their life and recognize that their life is still not in the condition that it ought to be in. So they repent, and they come to confession again, and then they say, well, that's my real salvation date. It's kind of a stupid game. We're making this ritual of confession and religiosity our standard by when we become Christians. Jesus Christ opens up the door to salvation to us. It's in His hands. It's not about being circumcised. It's not about being, uh, about confessing, uh, uh, you know, praying the sinner's prayer in the right way with the amount of fervency that we ought to. It's what Jesus has done that's opened up the door to the Gentiles. So now they're a part of this. They're a part of this thing this relationship with God. Paul goes on about Jesus. So he's talking about Jesus now. Jesus is our peace. Okay, you can't be at war with one another. These two groups were at war with each other. They hated each other. You can't be at war with each other if you have Jesus Christ. You need to be at peace. For he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups, Gentiles and Jews, into one and has broken the dividing wall, that is, the hostility that is between us. Okay? Doesn't this sound like a really contemporary lesson? How important it is for us today. Because we are so divided. We intentionally divide ourselves by right wing and left wing in our groups, by color in our country, by all of these different things that are really so unimportant that don't last into eternity. Okay? We are divided. Jesus Christ overcomes his hostility. And so before you start pointing at everybody else and say, well, it's all those people that cause the division. As soon as you point your finger at those people, you are a part of the divisive nature and the hostility that creates a dividing wall. Jesus Christ is supposed to overcome this hostility and bring peace to those divisions. No politics can do that. Okay? No ritual can do that. But Jesus is capable of overcoming all of our divisions. Gosh, it would be like, I don't know, a Baltimore Ravens fan and a Steeler fan sitting down together and having a civil conversation because they share Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ can overcome these walls of division. We realize how unimportant these things are. So look on, uh, verse 15. Jesus, again, he's the subject of everything that's going on here, Paul's work right here. Jesus has abolished the law, the circumcision. It's no longer a need to be circumcised in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's abolished the law with his commandments and ordinances. Why would he do that? All the, so all of the ordinances and commandments... And I'll tell you why. Because ordinances and commandments are all contextual in nature. I know we, we get in a fuss uh, about the Ten Commandments and, and people, you know, I just saw this article about Christians again getting upset about atheist groups wanting to get rid of the Ten Commandments off the courthouse walls. Who cares? Who cares? I don't care whether the Ten Commandments are. Ten Commandments don't define who we are. These are laws and ordinances, and honestly, there's only one law in the kingdom of heaven. What is that again? One law. Love. Okay? Love as we have been loved. This replaces all of this, because any ordinance that you have, any commandment that you have, all the Old Testament laws were contextual in nature. Okay? They apply to a very particular context and time and are not flexible. They don't teach us how to love. What happens with laws and coordinates and commandments is we do exactly what we have to do in order to not be caught. Okay? I mean, I will confess. Let's face it. It's the same way with, I don't know, the speed limit. Okay, so we have a speed limit, 55 mile per hour, and you know what we are. Well, we want to know what the limits of the law are because we don't like just driving 55. Well, we can fudge it to 60, 62 because we, under, the, the, the rumor is, of course, I don't know whether this is true. You know, the police are really not going to pull you over. You're going 60, 62 or 7 miles per hour, maybe even up to 10 miles per hour over. So that's kind of a hedge around the law. We can go up to 62 to 65 without getting caught. You see... 55 has everything to do with a law and an ordinance, and we want to push the limits of those laws and ordinances because they're an annoyance, whatever. But if we say instead, we want to drive 55 because it's safe and because we want to love our neighbor, well, see, then all of a sudden, if we want to love our neighbor and protect our neighbor, it doesn't matter what this, you know, we don't have to have a law for that about the speed limit. We say, gosh, I should slow down because I need to be protective of those around me. It transforms the way we think. And so this is why these things are so passe, okay? The Old Testament commandments, the Ten Commandments, I mean, I think they're important to learn because they kind of point us in the direction of Christ, but they fall short. The Ten Commandments fall short of God's expectations of us. That's not me, by the way. That's Jesus who says that. Love is the true law. So again, Paul is trying to tell us how Jesus Christ overcomes these burdens, uh, these uh, barriers. He's abolished the law with his commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. Again, we come back to that word peace again. That's the second time we've seen that word peace. And again, we hear that word hostility peace of Jesus Christ overcomes that hostility and that division. So that he might, verse 16, reconcile both groups of God in one body through the cross, putting to death hostility through it. Jesus Christ brings peace by putting to death hostility. So he came and proclaimed peace to you that were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. You're no longer strangers and aliens, but citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles, prophets, and Christ himself as a cornerstone. In him, the whole church is joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Okay, so we think of the temple as that place in Jerusalem. No, the temple is the body of Christ. Jesus didn't die for religious ritual. He died to bring us together. 
and to make us his holy temple. This goes back all the way to Genesis chapter 2. When God created the heavens and the earth, on the seventh day, what did he do? Hmm. He sat amidst his creation and rested. This was God's temple, to be with his people. We've made it about religion, about ritual, when it's about relationship with God and with one another. And so Paul is calling us to be one in Christ, because this overcomes the barriers of the ordinances, the commandments, the regulations that we seem to try to dominate one another. We create groupism. I'm a gentle. I'm a, you're a Jew. I'm a Christian. You're a Muslim. You're a this. You're a that. We label each other in order to dismiss one another. But Paul says Jesus Christ brings peace by putting an end to this hostility through what he's done in Christ. This is what we are supposed to do as Christians, to live a life of unity and peace. So I encourage you, if you're looking around at our country right now and say, oh, I can't believe all those people out there, you may be part of the problem. As long as there is a those people in your daily rhetoric, you're a part of the problem. Jesus Christ needs to put an end to your hostility towards other people. Oh, well, they're hostile to me. doesn't matter. You can't justify your hostility against somebody else by saying, well, they're hostile to me. No. Jesus Christ puts an end to the hostility. Somebody's got to risk Jesus Christ's risk. It cost him his life. The least we can do is risk and have Jesus put an end to our hostility. It doesn't matter what other people thought. The hostility to the world killed Jesus. But he's glad to do it so that he might bring peace. So you need to allow Jesus to put an end to your hostility so that you too might come to peace with those around you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, so many walls of division, color, religion, politics. Who cares about these things? They're not of eternal importance. Jesus is. See, none of those other things bring us together. They all create division. Jesus puts an end to this hostility and brings peace. So I'm praying, God, that we as the Church of Christ would give ourselves over to your peace today. For you ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pardon me. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and send you forth in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.